starting off this countdown, we have Gilles Garnet. Now, not only was this guy a witch, but he actually used his witchy powers to conjure up a potion that would transform him into a werewolf whenever he so pleased. That's right, he was a witch and a werewolf. In October of 1572 France, that's when Garnier killed his first victim as a werewolf. He grabbed the poor girl and dragged her into a vineyard. He then proceeded to tear the flesh off of her bones with his teeth and eat it. But he was still not satisfied after, so he went and ate another victim. He struck again the following month. He took on his werewolf form and attacked a man and ate his stomach. This kept going on and on until someone caught him. Well actually, they didn't really know it was him at first, but they claimed that they saw some weird weird man like beast crouching over and eating one of the victims. That's when the authorities were like, oh shit, there's a werewolf on the loose and then they were out looking for this weird werewolf man. While they were out looking for him, people kept going missing like crazy and eventually he was caught. One evening a group of workers were traveling across towns when they spotted the werewolf man. As they got closer, they saw it was Garnier and obviously reported his ass to the authorities. <laughs> At trial, he confessed to having stalked and murdered at least four individuals, but the number was indeed higher. In the end, he was found guilty of witchcraft and lycanthropy, and he was burned at the stake. Moving on to number four, we have Lassus Brigida. Lassus Brigida was an alleged Swedish witch back in the 1500s. In fact, she was the first woman executed for witchcraft in Sweden. Story goes that one night, her and two men met up at a churchyard cemetery with plans to resurrect people from the dead using their witchy powers. When they arrived at the church, Lassus used her powers to open the church doors. This involved her circling the place three times and then blowing into the keyhole. Magically it opened for them and they entered. While in the church they were looking for a stole. You know, the scarf type pieces of cloth that are worn by priests. That was needed in order to complete the ritual. After finally finding it, she renounced God and swore herself to the devil. Somehow, people found out that the three had attempted to resurrect the dead and reported them. Lassus was decapitated for being a witch, whereas the other two men were just fined. That's rough, man. That's rough. I'm also glad that their plan to bring back the dead didn't work. Like, imagine they would have to fight off witches and then zombies. Crazy. Coming in at number three, we have Agnes Waterhouse. Agnes Waterhouse, otherwise known as Mother Waterhouse, was the first woman in England to be executed for witchcraft. Agnes confessed to being a witch and having a familiar named Satan, which was her cat. Later on, the cat apparently took the form of a toad. The familiar originally belonged to her friend and fellow witch, Elizabeth Francis, but was later passed along to her. Furthermore, apparently Agnes would use her sorcery for evil. In 1566, she used her witchcraft to try and cause illness to a man named William Fine, and he was not so fine. After that, she used her powers to kill her enemy's livestock and as well as cause them illness. And lastly, she also tried to kill her husband using her powers. In fact, at her trial, one of her neighbors, a 12-year-old girl named Agnes Brown, came forward and testified against her. She claimed that she was visited by a demon dog under the control of Agnes Waterhouse. So according to the girl, one day she was visited by this demon that looked like a black dog with a face of an ape with a short tail, a set of horns, and a silver whistle around its neck. The demon dog appeared at her home and asked for some butter. She refused and apparently later that day he returned with a knife and threatened to kill her. She said that he said that he was going to thrust his knife in her heart and kill her. When the girl bravely asked to send him, the dog just turned his head toward Waterhouse's home. On July 29th, 1566, Agnes Waterhouse was executed. Before doing so, she repented and begged God for forgiveness. She also did admit that she was sending her familiar to her and damage her neighbor's goods. But her neighbor, a tailor named Wardall, had such strong faith that the familiar was unable to mess with him. In the end, Agnes was hanged for her crimes. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Francis. So Elizabeth Francis was friends with Agnes Waterhouse. Some even say that they were sisters. I don't know. But she was accused around the same time that Agnes was. She was the original owner of Satan, the white spotted cat and her familiar. According to Francis, she received the cat from her grandmother who was also a witch. Her grandmother, in fact, was the person who taught her all about witchcraft when she was only 12 years old. 
According to Elizabeth, her cat would speak to her in a strange hollow voice and also would do anything in exchange for a drop of blood, which is why they could get him to do all of their dark bidding for them. During trial, Elizabeth confessed to stealing sheep and killing a number of people, including a man named Andrew Biles. Andrew refused to marry Elizabeth after she became pregnant with his child, so she killed him. Later on, her familiar told her to make a certain concoction of herbs and to drink it and that that would terminate her pregnancy. She did, and it worked. Not only that, but when Frances finally married, she got her familiar to kill her husband and her daughter. Agnes also confessed to using her powers and familiar to kill one of her own pigs to see, you know, what it could do. And then she also killed her neighbor's cows and geese after they got in an argument. She got in an argument with the neighbor, not with the cows and geese, thought I should clarify. As I said before, the cat eventually turned to a toad on its own. So Frances was the first witch to be accused, and then she was the one who told everyone about Agnes in order to get a lighter sentence. So Elizabeth wasn't killed right off the bat. But 13 years later, she was accused again, and that's when she was killed for witchcraft. And in our number one spot today, we have Lori Cabot. The story of Lori Cabot is one that still blows my mind to this day. So Lori is the high priestess of the Salem Coven. She is well known among modern day witches. Now, Lori would only ever use her powers for good and to help people. In fact, she was psychic and she would use her psychic abilities in order to help police solve a number of crimes. The first time being during the disappearance and death of Martha Brailsford. So back in 1991, two people from Salem were reported missing. That was Martha Brailsford and her neighbor Tom Mamoni. Eventually Tom returned home and said that the two were sailing when Martha fell off the boat after being hit by a rogue wave. So police began searching the bay for Martha, but they were unsuccessful. That's when one of the investigators who knew about Lori and her abilities reached out to her for her help. Using just Martha's name, location and birth, she was able to tune in and locate her. Lori then said she got visions of Tom trying to make advances on Martha, but Martha was not into it. When she rejected him, he dragged her to the side of the boat and struck her head. He then put weights on her hips and attached an anchor to her feet and tossed her overboard. She even saw exactly where in the water Martha was. And guess what? She was right about all of that. A local fisherman ended up finding her body in the location that Lori had said. And Martha did indeed have anchors and weights attached to her body. When Martha's body was located, Tom fled. And so Lori was once again asked for help, but this time locating Tom. She once again tuned in and got a vision of Tom in a cabin, and got a vibe he was on his way to cross into Canada. Not only that, but Lori performed a binding spell on Tom to make sure he would do something stupid so that he would get caught. Well, three days later, police found the cabin Tom was staying in, and it was in a small town near the Canadian border. They found the cabin because Tom made a stupid mistake. He parked his car near the cabin and he left the lights on. Neighbors called the cops because they didn't recognize the car and they knew the neighbors were out of town. Isn't that crazy? Round of applause for Lori. Number five on this list is what I'm going to be nicknaming the Scottish Witch from the Woods. I stumbled across a Scottish story about a witch where they were unable to discover her name. Hundreds of years ago, when Scotland was still being first developed, there was a village in the north of the country. This village was positioned directly next to a forest that they wanted to chop down and expand into. When they began their process of chopping down the forest, a witch, or the Witch of the Woods, came out and warned them that if they continued, she would curse their entire community. The woman would become infertile, the crops would never grow, and people would go missing. Fearing for their safety, the group came to an agreement with this witch, where they were allowed to chop down a small section of the forest in exchange for leaving one sack every harvest of grain or produce by the edge of the forest. This agreement held true for quite a while until the community started to get less fearful and more greedy. They decided to go against this witch and chop down the rest of the forest without fear of consequence. When the witch came out of the forest again to address their betrayal, they refused to listen and they hung her immediately. Right before she was executed though, she said that the new price was three bags of grain. This fell on deaf ears though, except for one fearful farmer that decided to heed the warning for a little while. The community went on thriving until one once again, that farmer's fear was replaced with greed. He stopped delivering the grain, and that very same day, his youngest daughter went missing. The community looked everywhere, but nobody could find her until somebody checked the mill. Through the bricks and all over the walls, 
Blood started dripping down to the ground and they knew exactly where his daughter went. That mill has since been torn down but it was replaced with the silo and to this day the locals in that area still think that that silo is haunted by the Scottish witch in the woods. Number 4 on this list goes to the Paisley Witches. The Paisley Witches are actually nicknamed after the town of Paisley in Scotland where these witches were based. Christian Shaw was an 11 year old girl who was the daughter of a higher up in the Scottish community. It was this 11 year old girl who fell victim to the curse of several witches. It started with a deep sickness that manufactured itself like any other, fevers, chills, exhaustion. But some reports say that it became much more than that. The story goes that Shaw on one occasion levitated from her bed and on another occasion started chanting some deep curse. It was clear to everybody involved, including Shaw, that some form of Scottish witchcraft was a foot. Now she made it evident that she believed multiple witches were involved in causing her ailment, seven of them in fact. A trial was held for these witches where it was discovered that they all had the witches mark or the devils mark as some like to call it on their bodies. After this evidence came to light, the jury's decision was easy and all of the witches were sentenced to death. Now this story was a long time ago and it's hard to know for certain whether these individuals had anything to do with Shaw's ailment and witchcraft or if they were wrongly accused, tried improperly properly and the story has been exaggerated over time, which frankly is not unlike other potential witch stories during this period. The only thing that we can say for certain though is that the people back then and the 11 year old Christian Shaw believed wholeheartedly that this group of paisley witches was just that, witches. Number 3 on this list is Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan was a Scottish witch who traveled throughout Europe and actually isn't that far removed from present day. She died in 1956 and is known by some to be the last Scottish witch. As a young girl she was considered by most to be a normal, albeit outspoken and loud, growing child. It wasn't until midway through her life that she started seriously practicing witchcraft. Helen garnered a name for herself by regularly performing seances every evening and having the ability to communicate with the dead. During her nightly rituals she would invite viewers to come and watch. These viewers had reported seeing the materialization of ghostly figures directly in front of their eyes when Helen entered her deep witchly trance. Helen was also capable of and would often excrete a strange looking ectoplasm from her mouth while she was doing this. And if this wasn't enough, Duncan could also see things that others couldn't. At one point, the ghost of a sailor appeared and talked about a very secretive incident that had happened in World War II that the public or Helen Duncan couldn't have possibly known about. After hearing this information, the authorities realized that they couldn't have Duncan revealing any important state secrets about the war and arrested her for witchcraft immediately. It was revealed during her trial that some of her witchy ways were not what people were led to believe though. Like her ectoplasm was simply the regurgitation of a cheesecloth made to look like some type of ghostly substance. Even though some of her abilities were proven to be fraudulent, it still doesn't explain how she was able to accurately predict or say the things that she couldn't have possibly known. Helen Duncan didn't use any of her abilities to harm anyone, but the capability to potentially talk to the dead, it's still very chilling. Number 2 on this list is Thomas Weir and his sister Grizel. What makes Thomas and his sister so scary is that nobody expected them to be involved in witchcraft at all. Up until the end of his life, Thomas was known by most to be a nice man of the community held in high esteem. However, nearing the end of his life, Thomas came clean about who he really was telling the entire community during a religious service that he and his sister had been performing witchcraft for years. Going into deep detail about how they had consistent communication with the devil and had devoted their entire lives to carrying out his bidding. This bidding manifested itself in many different ways, most of which involved causing harm to others or in Thomas's case, getting it on with animals. Yeah. He was a weird dude. At first the community barely believed him, but after the sister came out and corroborated his story in detail as well, they started piecing it together. Thomas was always walking around with a big black staff. The neighbors had reported hearing strange sounds in the evening coming from their home and weird lights going off. Suddenly the guy that everybody thought they knew as their nice friendly neighbor was somebody else entirely. Reports say that when he was burned at the stake, he took far longer to die than a human should. Also his staff was burned with him and it emitted an extremely strange sound and moved in unnatural directions when it was burning as if it was being possessed by some force. I suppose that in the case of Thomas and Grizel, they had done such a good job at hiding their identities as witches and had been extremely methodical with their crimes that before they died they just had to let the world know just how evil they actually were. Number 1 on this list is Isabel Gaudi. 
Isabel was a Scottish witch from the 1600s and frankly, she did everything through several confessions that she made on her own accord. Without the pressure of torture or coercion from higher ups, Isabel admitted to taking part in a wide array of witchcraft activities. She admitted that she had freely let the devil suck blood from her neck and that she had romantic relationships with the devil before. She admitted to taking the body out of child's graves and using it in a ritual to destroy people's crops. She said that she had made clay effigies or voodoo dolls of someone's children and used these to harm and even kill them. Isabel was also part of a coven, a group of witches whose intentions were evil and had the ability to change their form into animals. She described in detail the brutal murders that she had committed for the devil and her fellow witches. She even offered up information about spells they had used to inflict illnesses on people, uttering some of them to the council she was confessing to. Now it's unclear exactly why Isabel decided to confess to these heinous crimes and oust herself as being a witch. She had to be aware that confessing to these crimes of this nature would surely mean her execution. It had been said though that she felt extreme guilt for her crimes and that's why she decided to come forward and accept the consequences as they were. Regardless of what her intentions were though, Isabel Gowdy has to go down as one of the most dangerous known witches in Scottish history. Starting off this countdown, we have John Reed. John Reed was one of the seven witches tried in 1697 Scotland. When he was caught, persecutors found that he had a mark on his loin. John said that the devil had nipped him there and that it indeed was a witch's mark. John also confessed that he was in service with the devil. The devil promised him wealth and abundance, but in return, John belonged to the devil. But John revealed that the devil broke his promise and never did anything he said he was going to do. On top of that, John admitted to attending a number of meetings with other witches. He also admitted that he was responsible for the torment of Christian Shaw. Christian was an 11 year old who claimed she encountered a pack of witches who then bullied her and stole her milk. He also admitted that they all drowned her in the local well. As a result of his confession, it was very clear that he was a witch and he was locked away in a cell. The next day though, he was found dead. He had hung himself in his cell with his own scarf. It was believed that this was the devil's work. The devil convinced him to take his own life because John exposed him. Within the following weeks, the other witches close to John took their own lives in their cell as well. Again, it's thought that the devil possessed them and killed them off one by one because he was pissed with them. In our fourth spot, we have Janet Howitt. Between in 1661 to 1663, 44 people in Fofor, Scotland were accused of witchcraft. Seven of those accused were executed. The fate of some of the others remain unclear. One of the main women was Helen Guthrie. She was not a nice lady at all. This woman murdered her own stepsister and the stepsister's children. But she was like, wait, 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 I'll help you, and claimed that she was able to identify other witches just by looking at them. So she said she would help them in the witch hunt if they went easy on her. She then went on to make up elaborate stories of witches meeting up at graves and eating the flesh of other humans, etc. The more she made up and pointed fingers, the longer she got to live. And same with her daughter, Janet Howitt. Janet was also accused of being a witch like her mom. In fact, she had a witch's mark on her shoulder. She said it was from the devil biting it. She also said that it hurt for so long until the devil visited her again and stroked her shoulder. When he did that, the pain immediately stopped. Now Janet was imprisoned with the rest of the accused, but we don't know what happened to her. They held a trial for her and no one testified against her. Plus they only had the mark on her shoulder as evidence. We truly don't know if young Janet was let go or sadly killed. What we do know is that her plea date was 1666, four years after her arrest. So she was in jail for quite some time. In our third spot, we have the Witches of Huntingdon. The Witches of Huntingdon were several individuals in the UK who were found guilty of witchcraft. First, we have Elizabeth Weed. Apparently one night, three spirits came to her and told her to renounce God and make a blood pact with the devil. So she listened and that's what she did. John Winnick also did the same, but only agreed to if the spirits would help him out financially. Others, including John Clark Jr., were also visited by these spirits and decided to also renounce God and make a deal with the devil. Out of the nine people accused, five were found guilty and hanged. Well, John Clark knew that they were going to search everyone's body for their witch's mark, which they all had. 
So what did he do? He cut off his three days before he was searched. Literally gouged it out of his skin so that the mark was gone. But I'm kind of confused because wouldn't that create another mark? I don't know, but I think he was let off the hook while he watched his friends be killed. He literally said, and I quote, it was foolish to let the authorities find their marks. I cut off mine three days before I was searched. He then denied ever making a pact with the devil or being a witch, even though he was. Moving on to number two, we have George Jacobs Sr. George Jacobs Sr. was an English colonist who was accused of witchcraft in 1692 during the Salem witch trials. George was quite the man around town. He had several run-ins with the Law. He was known for having a violent temper, and in 1677 hit a man named John Tompkins Jr. Two witnesses said, and I quote, One blow, and if the latter had not held him by the arms, he would have struck him some more, he being in such a passion. Now he was fine for this. Then in 1674, he was sued by his neighbor after he chased some of his horses into the river where they drowned. He argued that the horses were trespassing on his property, whereas others thought he just liked wreaking havoc on town. Fast forward several years later, George Jacobs Sr. and his son, George Jacobs Jr. and his daughter-in-law and granddaughter were all accused of witchcraft. Everyone got off except for Jacobs Sr. and that's cause he had a witch's mark. His body was searched and they found what was described as three teats on Jacobs. It was thought that if a person had an extra nipple, that this was a sign that they were a witch. Why? Well, it was believed that the extra nipple or teat was from when the devil or some demons sucked the witch's blood as a form of nourishment. It was said that Jacob Sr. had three of them. One in his mouth, one on his right shoulder blade, and one on his hip. Now, they weren't actually nipples though, it was just a quarter inch long fleshy thing protruding from his skin with a sharp point. They proceeded to stick pins in each of them to see what would happen. This was called the witch pricker. Apparently, if you are pricked and you don't have a reaction to getting pricked and you don't bleed, then you are a witch. Well, when they pricked each teeth, Jacobs never reacted to it and he didn't even bleed. So he was found guilty in August 5th, 1692 and was sentenced to be hanged along with the other witches. And in our number one spot we have Elspeth Rioch. Elspeth Rioch was an alleged witch in Scotland during the early 1600s. When she was 12 years old, she claimed that she was approached by two men. One was dressed in all black, the other in green tartan. The man in green told her that if she followed his instructions, that she would be able to obtain magical powers. He told her to boil an egg and use the condensation from cooking the egg and take it and rub it on her eyes with unwashed hands. Sounds like an eye infection to me. He said that this would give her the powers to see and know everything that she wanted. So she followed his instructions and bam, it actually worked. So now I kinda wanna go home and try it. I don't know, maybe it will work. And she actually developed clairvoyant skills. When Elspeth was older, she was visited again by the men. This time it was only the man in black. He showed up in her room one night. He told her that he was neither dead nor alive, but trapped between heaven and earth. He also told her that to maintain her magic skills, she needed to act dumb. That way, no one would suspect a thing. They'd be like, she's not a witch. No, she's way too dumb to be one. Well, eventually she was caught. In fact, she got in way more trouble because of her acting dumb. They were all like, she's fully a witch. She tried to trick us. Let's kill her. At her trial in March of 1616, she confessed to using her clairvoyant powers to spy on people, and she would also use magical spells to cure illnesses. Furthermore, when they inspected her body, they found a witch's mark. She had what appeared to be a scar in the shape of bite marks on her shoulder. Later, she confessed that she was bit by the devil and that was the mark that he left. She was charged with witchcraft and deceiving locals by pretending she was mute. In the end, she was executed by strangulation before having her body burned. Starting off this countdown, we have the North Berwick Witches. North Berwick is a small town in Scotland where some of the most brutal and horrific witch trials took place. It all started during the reign of King James VI. While on his way to get his new bride in 1589, he encountered a series of disastrous storms. In fact, the storms were so bad that he was forced to head back home. He immediately thought that the storms were the work of witches. It didn't help that back then a rumor had started that a witch had sailed out on the river forth to conjure up some storms. So from then on, King James was dead set on finding these witches. In fact, 70 to 200 women were accused of being witches. Most of them were tortured and then executed. Now, apparently, 
Apparently during these trials he did come across a number of women that admitted to being witches. They claimed that they had all made deals with the devil and were now under his command. They also claimed that they would use one of the churches there to hold their covens. They even said that this was the place where they had summoned the devil himself. In fact this church was located right on the seafront so James was like aha the perfect place to conjure up storms all of you are guilty. As a result these witches were strangled and then burnt at the stake. In our fourth spot today we have Sabrina Spellman. Although she's a fictional character Sabrina still deserves a spot on today's list. Without too many spoilers the show The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is about Sabrina, a teenage witch who on her 16th birthday has to sign her name in the Book of the Beast. Upon doing so she makes a deal with Satan. She basically gives herself to him in exchange for magical powers. At first Sabrina refused to do so because she didn't want to give up her mortal life. But later on she was forced into doing it in order to stop a number of evil forces that were murdering many of the townsfolk. Once she signed the book she is forced to do Satan's bidding. She has to basically bow down to him and do whatever he instructs her to do. In return Sabrina's magic became even stronger. In fact she became the fourth witch in all of history to summon demonic blue hellfire which was then used in order to fight off the Greendale 13. And for her to do that as a relatively new witch is very impressive. Later on in the show we also realize that Miss Wardwell is evil and is using Sabrina so she can become the queen of hell. Sabrina's destiny took a dark shift as soon as she made a deal with the Dark Lord. Although all the witches in the series have signed this book, the Dark Lord specifically needed Sabrina to sign it. Her destiny is far more different than the other witches in the show. Have you guys watched the show? Let me know in the comments below. Honestly I did but after season 2 I just I couldn't anymore. Let me know your thoughts though. Moving on at number 3 we have Lilith. Now the description of Lilith varies depending on your beliefs. In Jewish folklore Lilith is a female demon. In Luciferian witchcraft and Luciferism Lilith is described as the consort of Samael. Other people believe that she is the wife of Satan or that Lilith was the first wife of Adam. But she wasn't that obedient to him and Adam didn't like that so Lilith left. Then God made Eve who was more obedient. Lilith became jealous and turned into the snake that made Eve take a bite from the apple. The two were banished from the garden of of Eden and Lilith turned into a demon, her main goal to get revenge on all men. Then you have the people that believe Lilith is a child killing witch. She wasn't able to conceive so she was jealous of pregnant women and would go around killing them or stealing their babies. In this case we are looking at the version in which Lilith is a witch, obviously. In this case Lilith is working alongside Satan to do his dark bidding for him. Their deal is that if she's with him then she will work for him. But she's not always obedient, in fact she has gotten frisky with other men. In the TV series Supernatural, Lilith is depicted as a white eyed powerful demon. She is said to be the first human that made a deal with Satan and promised to serve him. As a result she became the first demon. In the chilling adventures of Sabrina we end up finding out that one of the characters, Miss Wardwell, is actually Lilith. She is referred to as Satan's concubine and the mother of demons and of course she's a witch. In fact she is said to be the first witch in existence. She made a deal with Satan or the dark lord. According to her story she was wandering the wasteland aimlessly when she encountered Lucifer the fallen angel. She made a deal to heal the wounds caused by the loss of his wings, if he in return helped her. She then pledged allegiance to him and became his handmaiden. In the end Lilith wants to become his queen which is why she goes to the extreme lengths to do whatever he tells her to do. Moving on to number 2 we have Sarah Good. Now if you have seen the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix then chances are you might be a little familiar with this story. The movie was loosely based off of the real witch Sarah Good, but in the movie they changed her name to Sarah Fear. So Sarah was one of the first three women that were accused of witchcraft. It was her, Sarah Osborne, and Tachuba. These two other ladies were said to be real witches and when they were accused they brought forth Sarah Good's name saying that she was a witch too, little tattletailers. The townspeople were quick to believe this because Sarah never attended church. She lacked self discipline and self control and she was 38 but apparently she looked like she was 70. That combined with the other lady's testimonies had everyone against her. In fact apparently when she was brought in front of the court a number of witnesses began to twitch and rock back and forth and moan. So they were all like damn she's definitely a witch. 
Look at what she's doing to the people that accused her of being one. Not only that, but her own husband and daughter even admitted to Sarah being a witch as well. And then things kept getting worse and worse for her. At one point in her trial, one of the accusers started acting out and claimed that Sarah attacked her with a knife. In the end, of course, she was found guilty of witchcraft and was sentenced to death. But just before her death, she made a deal with the devil to curse a priest. She said, and I quote, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. Now when she died, apparently the priest and his land both became cursed, just like Sarah claimed it would. To this day, it's said that Sarah continues to haunt the town, searching for those that have wronged her. And in our number one spot today, we have the Bonus Witches. In 1679, in Bonus, Scotland, a number of women were accused of being witches. These women were Annabelle Thompson, Margaret Pringle, Margaret Hamilton, Bessie Yicker, and another woman named Margaret Hamilton. Now during this time, the hype and fear of witches was dying down. So people were shocked that out of nowhere, five women were being accused. But rumor has it these women had renounced their baptisms and had been in contact with the devil on a number of occasions. They apparently had eaten, drank, danced, and had intercourse with the devil. Annabelle Thompson even admitted that she had made a deal with the devil for a better life. She had been widowed twice, and so she turned to the devil for help, and in return, she would be loyal to him. She then invited the other women to come over and do all these things with the devil with her. The women then apparently formed a demonic pact with each other and Satan. One of the Margaret Hamiltons also admitted that she had met the devil. She claimed that the devil came to her in the form of a black dog. And she said that she was his servant for three decades already. And another was accused of using her witch magic to help get wealth. As a result, all the witches were found guilty and were strangled at the stake before being burned to ashes. Mm -hmm.